Welcome to the Virtual Spring Meeting 2020, brought to you by the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. The Spring Meeting is the section's premier event, a multi-day celebration of learning and camaraderie. The Virtual Spring Meeting brings together the world's leading experts on competition, consumer protection, and privacy law, discussing the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to the Virtual Spring Meeting. My name is John Roberti, and today we have a terrific panel for you It is what to expect in FTC consumer protection enforcement. The panel is presented by the Advertising and Disputes Litigation and Consumer Protection Committees. With me to provide some context are two experts in this area. Stevie Pearl is an associate at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. And Jenna Ward is an associate at Faskin. Hi, Stevie. Hi, good morning. Hi, Jenna. Hi, John. Hi, John. All right, well, Stevie, let's start with you. What should we expect in today's panel? So the panel is comprised of a great group of folks who are both in private practice and in the government. So I think we can expect some really good discussion and maybe different you know, viewpoints about privacy regulation, data security, uh, FinTech, advertising and marketing, um, and probably also touching on some advice to you know, consumers and folks, not just consumers, but also companies who are really trying to figure out what to do um, outside of the COVID-19 crisis, but especially now that this pandemic has hit, you know, worldwide. Great. And Jenna, why is this all important? Well, John, for one, this panel is extremely topical. Um, though we're all feeling the impact of the COVID-19 crisis in our day-to-day lives, many businesses are still continuing to operate and many are innovating in ways they haven't before. Um, but our laws still apply. So as a practitioner, it's really critical to understand the FTC's enforcement priorities, regardless of the crisis we're in, in order to best provide timely and effective advice to clients. All right, great. Well, Stevie, Jenna, will you stick around and watch the panel with us? And then maybe we'll come back at the end and talk about some takeaways. Great. Great. All right. Well, then let's send it down to the moderator. Kaylin Brumbaugh, who will lead this today's panel. Kaylin, take it away. Thanks, John. I'm Kaylin Brumbaugh, and I'm pleased to be the chair and moderator of this session. I'm the chief legal officer at Guy Act Systems, which is a provider of real time bank account verification and identity verification services. I also serve as co chair of the Consumer Protection Committee of the Antitrust Section. We hope that if you enjoy this program and you're not already a member of one of or all of the three consumer protection focused committees that you'll join us. And those committees are consumer protection, privacy and information security, and advertising disputes and litigation. Now I'll start off by very briefly introducing our panel. They're all leaders in the consumer protection field and you're probably already familiar with them. So I'm not going to read their entire bios. Given that he's greatly outnumbered on this panel, I'll I'll start with a gentleman. Uh, Tom Ditch is the chair of the Emerging Technologies Practice at Thompson Hine in Cleveland, and he's also a longtime leader in the antitrust section. Serena Vishwanathan is the acting deputy director of the FTC Bureau of Consumer Protection, and, and without whom we really couldn't have this program, so thank you, Serena. Um, Terrell, Terrell McSweeney is a partner at Covington and Burling in DC and a former FTC commissioner. And last but not least, Christy Thompson is a partner in the DC office of Kelly Dry and she chairs the firm's advertising and marketing and consumer product safety practice. Now, whenever I chair these spring meeting sections, I always like to say that we want the session to be a dialogue rather than a monologue. And we always invite questions from the audience. While we can't really do that today, um, we definitely do want this program to at least be a dialogue among us on the panel. So our plan is to divide the program into six major subject areas. And we'll lead off each subject area with some comments from the deputy director regarding the FTC's priorities. And and then we'll have a discussion among us um, regarding those priorities and what we as practitioners should be thinking about to help our clients. Uh, To the extent there's any awkwardness in our approach, you can blame me. I um, 
tried to get my girlfriends to let me practice on them during one of our um, Zoom happy hour slash pity parties, and they just weren't very cooperative. So, so with that, let's let's start the program. Um, you know, unfortunately, discussing COVID-19 is unavoidable, not just because that's what we're living with right now in very challenging circumstances, but also because it's really bringing to the fore many key consumer protection issues. Uh, Chairman Simons posted on the commission's blog in late March regarding the work of the BCP during this time. And the commission has been putting out very informative alerts for both consumers and businesses. So we'll now turn it over to the Deputy Director to discuss the Commission's response to COVID-19. Thanks, Kaylin, and, and yeah, thanks for to the ABA for doing this in the alternative format. I think it's really, it's still really helpful. So first, as a disclaimer, I have to say that um, anything I say today reflects my own views and not those of the Federal Trade Commission or any commissioner. Uh, but that said, yeah, obviously the pandemic has created unprecedented stresses on our families, our communities, uh, and the economy. And at the FTC, we know that this ultimately affects consumers. Um, unfortunately, one thing is that every crisis seems to bring out bad actors um, who take advantage of these circumstances, and this is no different. But a lot of what we're doing is the same kind of thing we've done before, um, combat deception and unfairness, do consumer and business education, but now it's just specifically focused on you know, the, the challenges presented by COVID-19. So a couple of examples. The first thing is that, of course, immediately we started to see ads for treatments and cures for COVID. And as we've done before with certain you know, health outbreaks, we worked with FDA and quickly sent out warning letters and we continue to do that um, to companies that were making these kinds of deceptive claims. Uh, those have been pretty effective to get those claims down, but you can expect to see some more law enforcement in that area. Um, we also just sent out warning letters with the Federal Communications Commission to VoIP providers who may be assisting and facilitating robocall scams that re are related to COVID-19. Um, so just given the um, kind of economic effects of the pandemic, we are concerned just as um, with the previous e economic downturn that we'll see you know, mortgage relief scams, government grant scams, charity scams, the things that affect economically distressed consumers. Um, we're also doing consumer outreach through creating new consumer education materials, uh, reaching out to local TV stations, holding webinars to educate consumers about these scams. You know, our, our dedicated website is ftc.gov coronavirus. That sets out kind of everything we're doing. Um, and finally, businesses can also be victimized right now by bad actors. So we've been putting out resources for businesses. Um, we are, as you mentioned, Chairman Simons uh, put out a statement because we are aware that there are businesses that are trying to do the right thing. They aren't trying to take advantage. They're trying to get out necessary goods and services to consumers. And we, you know, if there are concerns about um, compliance, we have a dedicated email inbox, uh, business.covid at ftc.gov, where we can field questions that businesses might have about how to comply. Um, and, you know, as Chairman Simon said, we will take into account the circumstances in terms of our enforcement right now. Thanks, Serena. What I wanted to do next was just ask the members of the panel to share with us the observations that they have regarding specific issues our clients should be aware of, or perhaps specific questions that, that they're getting right now. Tom, do you want to lead off? Sure, um, and, and let me start by expressing appreciation for your referring to me as a gentleman. Uh, that's always gratifying uh, at times like this. But what, uh, seriously, what we are seeing, and I'll give you an example, is I was just talking with my son, the college student who's attending school from home, uh, for the next quarter uh, of a scam he faced where someone was able to impersonate his internet service provider and uh, suggest that he sign on to a specific VPN. And I was able to tell him that is a classic scam. And so just as you know, fraudsters and thieves are going to exploit any weakness in the system, we're seeing very targeted attacks at the security of uh, communications and data stores and the like. I'm the security officer for my firm, so this is what I'm losing sleep over, and it's making sure 
that our systems are protected, but I think most importantly, the great, where I see the great vulnerability is on the human factor side. All of us are doing our best to do our jobs. We're you know, doing this seminar from home. We're all trying to be responsive and effective for those we serve. And the ability to exploit that motivation is what is driving a lot of the behavior we're seeing. So what we do internally and we're advising clients to do is to make sure you educate and re-educate and re-educate your staff, your employees, your team about what to be looking out for. And you just can't over communicate can't over communicate this. There's a second level we're advising our clients on though, and that is just as you have to protect your own systems and advise your own people, that every business is dependent on third parties to provide services to them from their payroll to their benefits obviously the communication service providers, all the people who handle information and communications for them uh, also are re working remotely. So the companies really have to, and all of us have to up our game in making sure we're on top of not only our own security practices, but what their service providers are doing. And so a lot of good, you know, well-run companies are reaching out actively to their service providers. I mean, they reach out to us as lawyers and say, tell us what you're doing to protect our information. And we're we're happy to respond, and I think that that's the practice we're seeing. So I think, you know, if you attack a company, you steal one company's data, you attack a service provider, you can steal potentially hundreds of companies and individuals' data. So that's that's where we see the challenges and where we're trying to help clients out. We are seeing a proliferation of scams, and unfortunately, we're seeing some that succeed, uh, especially in tax season. So that's what we're seeing, uh, Kaylin, and uh, not completely unexpected and unforeseeable but it's something that's uh, of high incidence right around now. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Christy, what are you seeing? Sure, thanks, Kaylin, and, and thanks everybody for joining us today. We're seeing a lot of questions, particularly from our clients that have historically had some online presence, but now are really uh, generating a lot of their primary sales through online channels and have really shifted to digital advertising as a result of that. So certainly a lot of questions about substantiation is you have people who historically might not have been drafting claims um, because they were focused on more digital campaign kind of the marketing initiatives and now they are drafting the fundamental claims around products. So we're seeing questions about substantiation and then also just on the execution. So if we've Got, client, uh, got customers who have bought products, now how do we make sure they get the products? And so questions uh, around things like the mail order rule and ensuring that in this world of so many questions about distribution chain and ability to staff distribution centers, um, making sure that they are up to speed on the rules around the mail order rule. And then kind of going to the, the marketing side, telemarketing, um, clients that engage regularly in that have been focused on some of the state requirements, particularly those that have special requirements in states that have declared emergencies, um, like New York, Louisiana, have some nuances to their rules on the tele telemarketing front, and then also on the marketing side, promotional pricing, where we have been very busy in recent years in counseling clients on that side, uh, but now even more so because they're trying to drive traffic to the site or to the app and want to give consumers a good deal to get them to purchase and just navigating those state laws as they do it. Thanks, Christy. Carol, what are you seeing? Well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for putting this together. And Kaylin, thanks uh, so much for, for holding this electronically and doing a great job as a moderator. Um, you know, I will second the things that have been said already on the panel. I agree privacy and data security are definitely at the fore as we transition to our new remote working environments. Um, and of course, what we're also seeing are inquiries around some of the additional products um, companies are wanting to use now to support their, their teleworking workforces. So I think that's a, a very timely issue. I've also been getting a lot of questions around price gouging. And while that isn't typically necessarily a consumer protection issue or even an FTC issue, although Congress has uh, been thinking about in some of these relief packages giving the FTC price gouging authority, we do see a lot of state laws, especially states using their mini FTC acts, to think about what is acceptable pricing, especially around healthcare or medical related products in this kind of state of emergency. 
Uh, so I think that's a really interesting area. There are implications at the federal level with the Defense Production Act, uh, for sure. And at the state level, um, there's basically 50 states of, uh, of different laws. Some have on the book specific price gouging laws and others, um, as I said, are using their mini FTC acts to decide if a practice is unfair or not. Some are in the process of updating those laws or even acting by executive order or statements from attorney generals about how they're going to be enforced. So we're seeing a lot of questions around making sure that the people who are thinking about how to price products in this environment are, are following those consumer protection laws as well. Thanks, Carol. I'll, I'll throw in my own observations as the general counsel and leader of a very small in-house legal team of two. And as you can imagine, I've been getting all kinds of questions um, in areas that are not my area of expertise. And so I just wanna thank all the law firms out there, including the firms represented by the panelists on this program for the really great work product that you're putting out. I, I know that trying to do that while actually billing hours and dealing with kids doing homeschool and all sorts of other challenges um, is, is a huge challenge in and of itself. And I know when I was in private practice, I would always ask the question whether that non-billable stuff I had to do really mattered. And I just wanna say from the perspective of a client, this really has mattered. It's made a huge difference for us and I'm sure a lot of your other clients out there as well. Um, now we're gonna talk about privacy. Um, which uh, there have also obviously been implications in the privacy world as the result of the virus. Um, and I'll turn it over to Serena to share with us what some of the commission's enforcement private priorities are in the area of privacy. Sure, thanks, Kaylin. Um, so, for, so for privacy, I mean, the first thing I would recommend is that people go to the FTC's 2019 Privacy and Data Security Report, or update, I'm sorry, because that gives a sense of the types of cases and policy work we did in the area last year, and it's much, it, it summarizes it much better than I ever could here. Um, in terms of kind of recent privacy developments and projects, the COPPA rule review is ongoing. Um, as you can imagine, we received thousands of comments on that. Um, and so we're working through those. Uh, we've also brought a couple of interesting cases in the privacy area. One was against a stalking app that was called Retina X. Uh, another one was a kind of an internet of things case. It was brought against a smart lock or an internet connected padlock for deceptive claims about their privacy or their data security practices. Um, and we have some upcoming events too. I mean, how you know, those will happen logistically might depend. It might kind of be something like this. But for now, um, we do have something called Privacy Con, which we do regularly. That is a way to present some of the research, the latest research um, on consumer privacy uh, issues. And we also just announced a workshop on data portability issues. And that's being done with our colleagues in the Bureau of Competition. Thanks, Serena. Um, Tom, what, what are sort of challenges are you seeing um, from your clients um, in the privacy area and what takeaways do you have from the FTC's recent enforcement actions in that area? Sure. Um, let me give a kind of an operational qu uh, answer and a substantive answer and then we'll get to the FTC. Operationally, um, I don't think fatigue is the right word, but clients have been through successively GDPR compliance if they've got European operations and CCPA compliance, uh, anyone who does business in California meaningfully. And so there has been a devotion of a tremendous amount of resources in putting up these compliance programs, dealing with statutes that are full of easier said than done requirements. And so we get into you know the first quarter of 2020 and the idea is taking stock and those who are responsible for the compliance seeing what they've been neglecting, uh, which may too, be too strong of a word, but where they have not paid enough attention to uh, while they're doing the very heavy lifting, again, successively of GDPR followed by CCPA. And um, so, you know, in that, there's a lot of, of, of effort 
And through that, so you've got an idea of the extent to which there are resources available. Privacy is never, you know, non, is never negotiable. It's something that they have to do, but understand that the ability to pivot quickly is, will always be challenged. And now we move in to the COVID-19 environment, making it even tougher. So there's a prioritization that's going on and no disrespect at all to the commission who plays a very important role. But there's lots of players to keep happy. We're looking at you know Brazil coming down the line and India coming down the line. And it's forcing, I think, a new look at harmonization uh, of what are good global standards uh, to, to apply because there's only so many people to run parallel systems for even within the United States, between states and, and the federal government and all of those uh, who, pay a, who play a part in this. So that's the procedural or operational side I'm seeing. Substantively, what I'm seeing is uh, kind of a, a high level look at now that there's some good understanding overall, having gone through these processes I've talked about, to make sure they've got the handle on the data and can apply meaningful, workable solutions, that everything that has been implemented can actually be done by real human beings for real human beings, and that match up um, how operations continue to develop. So it really is, is juggling those balls at the same time. And the FTC has a role to play in that the update is a very valuable document, I agree. Uh, but that's one player in this um, in terms of the privacy enforcement. Um, and so I think you know, the, F the FTC will continue to play its important role as one of the cops on the beat. Um, and those enforcement cases, to me, look you know, well proportioned and well chosen uh, on the privacy side. Um, and uh, or, 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 or add to the toolkit of, of how we design the programs. You know, Tom, you raise one of the big concerns for me as in-house counsel, and that's this harmonization issue. Um, Carol, I know you've been doing some thinking about whether there might be a federal privacy law and sort of the likelihood of that. And do you have any good news to report on that? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I don't at this point. I mean, I think as you can imagine, the COVID crisis has sucked up a tremendous amount of legislative oxygen. So while we were seeing some hard won progress around compromise, uh, you know, really up until the fall, we haven't seen a tremendous amount of momentum since. Um, I will say one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing um, that really also cries out for harmonization um, are some of the issues that are starting to arise in the AI field, where I also do a lot of counseling. Um, and, and I noticed today the FTC did put out some AI guidance that, again, focuses a lot on, on some of the basic questions, including data quality. So I think one of the things we're really seeing is um, different guidelines for how to, to approach AI, including data measures and privacy measures. And those are flowing from Europe as well as now in, in the US. And so I think that's another area that we're, we're watching very carefully. In the meantime, states continue to innovate, um, including on facial recognition and their own privacy laws. Um, and we, we definitely see the, the federal legislative process lagging behind that. So I wish I had better news and answer to your question, Caitlin, but I think I'm not holding my breath, at least at this point, for, for action in this Congress given everything that's now on their plate with the COVID crisis and the economic fallout from it. Well, we'll continue to cross our fingers. Um, consistent with what Tom was talking about on some of the operational issues, one thing that I've been thinking about as a general counsel is, you know, what sorts of things we should do when we all go back to work with respect to privacy, because people are working from home, potentially using personal devices for work, um, and I think we all really think of, ought to think about what process we want to have in place when we go back to sort of inventory what people have been doing, where they may have been storing data, um, and make sure that as soon as reasonably possible, we can get things in the right place and get things deleted if they're where they shouldn't be. Um, where we're going to go next is, is data security. Um, you know, the breaches continue. I have read about a couple just in the last week or two. Um, some of them are somewhat novel. Um, you know, I've, I've heard um, anecdotally from friends about people breaking in, hackers breaking into their kids' 
Zoom online classes and, you know, shouting profanities and things like that. But then there have been the typical data breaches with loss of consumer data as well. So, Serena, can you tell us um, about some of the bigger uh, data breach enforcement cases and, and what may be coming down the pike at the commission? Sure. Um, yeah, and, and they a lot of them were kind of summarized in the data security update. Um, and of course, there were some big one, you know, last year, for example, the settlement with Equifax. Um, but, you know, our, the, the thing that I wanted to point out was about our data security uh, consent orders with companies. We've modified them in a few ways. Um, and we've described that in some blog posts. And, and you can see the orders and the language in, on our, our website. Um, but, you know, most um, particularly, we've added some specificity. And that's just to make the FTC's expectations clearer to consumers, um, also to improve order enforceability um, in the light of some court cases. Um, and we have a couple of things that are probably of interest, which are that, you know, we have some more requirements on third party assessors. Um, we require senior corporate officers to annually certify compliance to the FTC. I mean, those are in consent orders. Um, you know, they weren't necessarily, we're not saying that all of those requirements are required for a company's data security practices to be found reasonable, but we think those are useful. Um, and appropriate to monitor these companies that we believe have violated the law. Um, and there are studies, for example, for things uh, like the corporate officer certifying compliance, we've seen studies that seem to indicate that board level attention to things like data security does help prevent breaches. So we, we want to encourage companies to think about how they treat information security from you know, that aspect. Um, in terms of some other projects going on, we are reviewing the Graham Leach Wiley Safeguards Rule. That's out um, right now. That's the rule about financial institutions and their data security um, requirements. We have a workshop on that scheduled for May, and that is um, open for comments right now. Um, and you know, as you mentioned, in the COVID crisis, I know there's some questions about um, you know what is the FTC standard now under these circumstances? I mean, the FTC standard is for data security and evaluating it is, is still reasonableness. Um, but as Chairman Simon said, you know, during this, it's a national emergency. We're trying to remain flexible and reasonable, um, you know, considering good faith efforts and the, circum the particular circumstances in terms of making enforcement decisions. It's not a open season to violate the law, of course, but we, you know, we certainly are taking into account the circumstances and um, when, we're, when we're going to take enforcement decisions. Thanks. Uh, Tom, are you saying that the, the consent decrees in the data security data breach area are changing the advice you're giving to clients or have you seen an evolution in that device over the, advice over the last year or so? I'm going to be careful in how I answer that question. I spent a lot of time with security officers. I mean, a couple of, a couple of weeks ago on one of these video conferences with about 20 of them. And we're discussing certainly the current challenges and what's driving them and what's calibrating what they do. And I'll have to say from anecdotally that I certainly appreciate the specificity of the post lab MD data security orders so we can give meaningful advice on FTC enforcement practices. But when it comes to a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer with counsel, with other staff, designing a data security program, assessing and then designing, I frankly don't see a lot of resort in the first instance to the consent decrees, right? The same way, you know, you may not look in the first instance at the terms of a settlement of a class action lawsuit and a deceptive advertising claim. To, to give advice on how one, uh, uh, in the first instance, uh, acts and performs and complies. So there are a proliferation of good substantive standards that companies use. You can use the NIST standard, the Massachusetts, the old Massachusetts data security statute gives a, a framework, and there's other frameworks that one can use in the first instance to create programs and to make something that's, that's accountable and ascertainable. And then in the back, not say the background, but on the back end, the FTC enforcement uh, guidance given in its cases uh, and its consent decrees can be helpful 
when we talk about what consequences can be and what's expected. There's just so much pressure on, on businesses and directors and officers and GCs to have good data security practices. You know, for many of these companies, long before the FTC would get done enforcing, they'd be out of business or would have lost a tremendous amount of business. And so there's a lot of motivations to do this and to do it the right way. Uh, and I want to be careful, the FTC has a very important role to play in enforcement. We're glad they're there. I'm a consumer, uh, so I'm glad they're there to protect us uh, in the appropriate circumstances. But I think, I think it's time, we, we ought to be looking uh, at lots of approaches to this and the great, the great beauty of a federal system is you can have complementary actions at various levels. My own home state, and while my governor is enjoying you know, great public relations of positivity these days, uh, I'll use an Ohio example. We have a statute in Ohio that if a company adopts a reasonably sufficient data security system, actually implements it, actually follows it, um, then they'll have an immunity from liability under Ohio tort law. It's a limited relief, but it's a model that says, if you're a victim, you're a victim. If you're negligent, you're negligent. That if you take appropriate steps to protect yourself, then we shouldn't be imposing too many remedies on a victim. We don't sue every bank every time it's robbed, right? So I think having this mix of enforcement uh, approaches is useful. But I think the good news for all of us is there's a lot of uh, reasons companies are, are paying close attention to the security of their information and systems. Uh, very helpful. Uh, Terrell, what, what sorts of insights do you have for, for clients with respect to, to data security and what we can learn, not just you know, from the FTC enforcement actions, but as Tom said, other state laws and kind of the what I would say is the holistic approach that's needed to really assessing data security. Well, I agree with a lot of what Tom said. Um, and I guess I think what I, the lesson I really draw from the changes in the FTC consent orders, which I think are highly relevant to providing good counseling around what is reasonable data security practice, is this emphasis that Serena noted on high level board and C-suite accountability for data security programs. So I think one thing I would say is, is if that still doesn't exist within your organization, and I'm curious to get Tom's reaction since he's also on the front lines of this, that, that maybe it's worth looking at, at whether you have in place uh, a system that is sufficiently sophisticated for the amount of data um, that, that you're handling. And again, of course, it isn't a one size fits all approach and the FTC has recognized this. I think states recognize this as well. Um, it is a reasonableness standard that is based on what your business is doing, the level of sensitivity of the information it's handling and um, you know what the, what the practice ought to be around protecting it. But I think we do see increasingly this idea that you know, there really has to be a, a program in place that is accountable at the highest levels of the company as a, as a key factor in thinking about whether it is um, appropriately resourced and, and appropriately um, located within an organization. Yeah, if I could, Daryl, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, internally in my own role, um, I've insisted on, you know, executive sponsorship and board visibility. In a law firm, that's a different structure, but that's certainly, I, you know, I, I can't see the system working without that. And when we counsel clients, I couldn't agree with you more that we say we need the same thing. You need executive sponsorship and you need board visibility in any of this so that everyone gets the idea that this is, this is not a negotiable uh, part of the company's business. One thing that occurred to me is sometimes when we're, we're doing tabletop exercise or mock data breach exercises, you know, within, within companies, you, you know, you, you try to think of what might be a really outlandish set of circumstances and use that as that hypothetical, so to speak, for your exercise. Um, Tom, what are your thoughts about trying to do one of those right now? Because this certainly is a scenario we wouldn't have thought would be possible a year ago. Yeah, I think you have to, I mean, what I've said in these circumstances is when you design a tabletop exercise, a drill, you want to design it so you get a C plus, all right? You don't want everyone to walk out patting themselves on the back. What you want to say, okay, where is it? Where are our points of possible failure? Let's identify those. And there's a challenge right now to getting people's attention, getting management's time, you know, when companies are laying people off uh, and dealing with other situations. So I understand the time constraints, but it is bringing this to the fore. And I think having 
this type of foreseeable event, part of the, of, of the planning and scenario uh, design, I think is, is very appropriate. And, uh, you know, what do we say? Never put a good crisis to waste or let a good crisis go to waste. And this is a time to be, uh, to be incorporating this into our planning. But I think it's been covered earlier in our conversation right now is also a critical time for training and reminders and really addressing uh, the, the human factor and, and where we know we have some of the most fallible points in all of our systems. Um, I think sending out the reminders around phishing emails, being really vigilant, uh, monitoring systems at the moment, uh, as, uh, as tough as that is in this challenging environment is really, really good practice. That that's an excellent point, and you know maybe just reminding folks that you know the 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 training is taking less than the time of the commute that they're not having to do anymore would make it a little more palatable to them because I I think you're right you this is really a, an, an important time to be reminding people. What we're going to do now is is jump to a specific industry um, instead of sort of a subject matter and we're going to talk about fintech um, it's obviously becoming increasingly important and right now it is a critical industry so we're going to turn it over to serena to, to talk about the priorities at the commission with respect to the fintech industry um, yeah sure the message i think the ftc wants to get out of course is that we want companies to innovate and um, that can be good for consumers in the financial services space but of course as always we're watching out for deceptive and unfair practices um, a lot of what we see actually in the fintech space is kind of old conduct in new updated clothing so um, it you know would be a crypto it would be a business opportunity or a multi-level marketing scheme but it's about cryptocurrency so there is a lot of that um, we also have been active in online lending in, the, in that arena um, where we've seen some deceptive or unfair practices. So we had settlements, I think it was last year or um, within the last couple of years with um, Avant, a lo online loan servicer, um, SoFi, we're currently in litigation with Lending Club. Um, also, this is um, more topical, I think, with the um, COVID crisis is we are interested in some of the financial products that are being offered to small businesses. Um, we did recently do a workshop or a few months ago, we did a workshop on that. And we recently put out a staff perspective summarizing that. Um, what we are concerned about is that small businesses are suffering greatly with this pandemic. And there are um, certain types of financial products that are targeted at them. They're not exactly loans and they are ripe for certain types of consumer protection problems and so we think this is an area where we're, we're concerned that the COVID crisis will create more problems and so that's an, another area that we are going to pay some close attention to. Christy what what areas in, in the fintech industry are you seeing arise for your clients? Yeah so certainly as Serena mentioned um, some of the the same uh, areas where the FTC is always engaged in enforcement and just in new contexts. And I think a lot of that comes out in digital advertising and um, where there are financial offers being made, but now in new platforms with uh, every day, you know, a new, a new bell or whistle associated with that platform and ensuring that the disclosures associated with whatever the financial offer is are clear and conspicuous. And a lot of talk about the FTCs.com disclosures guidance in that space and what they would require and trying to think about how a consumer's interaction with the app would actually flow and work and ensuring that they see all of the necessary disclosures as they navigate through that process. Uh, a little bit uh, unrelated, but yet related to the fundamental of kind of disclosure and um, authorization. We've got uh, several clients, although not directly in the fintech space, but that are in the gaming space that have been watching the FTC's uh, workshop and other activity related to loot boxes and ensuring that uh, consumers, often children, are adequately informed uh, about the um, consequence of digging in that box to see if they're gonna get some superpower to help them perform uh, better in the game. And um, we'll look to see uh, what comes out of the FTC's workshop, but regardless of what comes out of the workshop, it's still those fundamentals of ensuring sufficient disclosure and getting authorization to impose some sort of a charge. 
Thanks, Christy. Carol, I'm curious about what observations you might have about sort of the evolution of the commission's enforcement in the fintech industry, you know, given your service as a commissioner. Um, and then, you know, what sorts of issues might be arising for your clients in that industry right now? Well, I think since we have breaking news today to talk about in terms of the AI guidance that was just put out today, I, I wanted to spend a minute talking about it because I do think it's highly relevant to this set of issues and also answers your question somewhat. Um, I thought that that guidance really referenced the 2016 Big Data uh, Report, Tool for Inclusion and Exclusion, incorporating a lot of its recommendations, but putting some emphasis on transparency, explainability, fairness, continued compliance with FICRA, um, you know, assessment of factors that are being used in risk scores to the extent those are being used, and incorporated some of the, the current cases that Sabrina was talking about as well. So. I, I encourage folks to take a look at that. I mean, I think it's probably not entirely breaking news and it's relatively consistent with what the FTC has said in the past, but increasingly what we really see are, are clients really trying to understand what are the requirements for ethical and fair use of predictive technologies and artificial intelligence. We're seeing AI being used and, and ML being used in a number of products across the board, um, and, and I think it's a really promising technology in a lot of respects, um, but you know, continue to really remind folks that it does come with some requirements. I think the other thing that we sometimes see is, uh, especially when, when we're dealing with uh, new technologies, um, old laws apply. So those brick and mortar laws, equal opportunity laws, civil rights laws, uh, FICRA as well, which has been on the books you know, for decades um, come into play and, and it's important to be mindful of, of those requirements and responsibilities, even if you're dealing with cutting edge technology. And I think it comes up in the financial services and product space, um, you know, with some, with some frequency. Thanks. So next we're gonna move to another substantive area, advertising and marketing, which is always really interesting to me to talk to advertising and marketing lawyers and to see the cases that the commission is bringing. And that's probably just because I'm often flabbergasted at the types of claims that companies make about their products and services, but I'm guessing that lawyers are not really their intended audience. So with that, I'll, I'll let Serena talk about what the commission is doing with respect to advertising and marketing. Yeah, oh, great. Thanks, Kaylin. Yeah, and this is, of course, a topic close to my heart because I am an advertising lawyer at the FTC for, uh, for 20 years. But yeah, historically, the FTC has been concerned with a few areas in uh, advertising. One, of course, has been false and unsubstantiated health claims. And as I mentioned at the beginning, of course, right now, that's especially critical. But bef uh, before that, and you know, continuing, we tar we've been targeting products aimed at serious diseases, um, diseases of the aging population like dementia, arthritis. Um, we are concerned about some of the claims we're seeing for newer products. So we've sent warning letters to companies marketing CBD products um, with deceptive claims. Uh, a second big area, which you, you probably have noticed if you're following the FTC, are endorsements and testimonials, and that includes online reviews and influencer issues. Uh, we frequently see deceptive endorsement issues going along with other types of false claims, so companies should be, um, when they're reviewing their claims, they should make sure that they're reviewing the claims as well as the other kinds of practices that they're engaging in. Um, like A recent example of that is, is a case called Teamy, which was a diet tea and the company was making deceptive weight loss claims uh, through influencers but also there was the issue of the influencers you know not necessarily disclosing their connections um, speaking of that we've had a series of cases about kind of compensated or on or fake online reviews because it seems like companies cannot resist reviewing their own products and not telling people that it's them um, and, and on that note, also, we have the FTC's endorsement guides, which are now out for comment. It's been 10 years, or probably more than 10 years, since they were put out or revised. So we're really interested in hearing from stakeholders on those issues that they want to see addressed. I mean, the world has changed a lot in 10 years. Uh, and finally, in general, advertising and marketing, as I mentioned before, we're really interested right now in, in issues that are, are scams that are going to hurt consumers' bottom line. 
Um, so that includes, you know, like student loan, mortgage modification scams. Um, the, anytime there's a legislation that is giving out free money, there are people who will then say, well, we can get you your money faster or something like that for a fee. And that's, um, you know, all, that's kind of a common scam. And we're just worried of see, that we're going to see more of that spiking. And we actually already have given the financial pressures that consumers are suffering from the pandemic. Yeah, Serena, I had a question. Um, you know, there's so many jokes of parents that are having to homeschool going around about, you know, where they're, they're getting their kids iPads or whatever that they never would have gotten them before. And so, and, and kids are spending a lot more time, I think, in front of televisions and computers and so forth. So I'm wondering, if, is there any heightened awareness with respect to advertising directed at children? Um, yeah, I mean, I think advertising directed at children has always been an issue um, that the FTC is interested in. You know, we, the children are a different target audience. And I think maybe it was Christy who had mentioned before that, you know, we look to, you know, the, the kids as a target audience are not necessarily going to understand claims or maybe not be, um, have the same understanding as adults would. So we are certainly interested if we're seeing, if if we start to see more of that in this in this era, um, but it's it's been a, a consistent interest of the FTC. Christy, I know you spend a lot of time um, advising your clients on advertising and marketing issues. So, what what sorts of things are you seeing now? What sort of practical observations do you have for for clients in light of the the FTC's priorities? Sure. Um, so just circling back on what Serena just said, uh, uh, two highlights with respect to endorsements in particular. One is that the FTC has requested comments on the current endorsements that are out there. Um, and certainly companies that are interested in that should let their voice be heard. But within that, the FTC asks uh, where a specific area where they've solicited feedback is what children think about disclosures, for example, of, of a material connection between an endorser and the product being endorsed. And so um, that's just one example of where the FTC has, has looked uh, to how consumers, uh, children consumers are processing information. The other note about endorsers uh, and influencers, we do get a lot of questions about that. And uh, Serena also mentioned the TME settlement if you have not taken a look at that it is a little has some different provisions in it from the other settlements in this space and um, i would encourage everyone to do that for example um, the order includes uh, specific requirements for disclosure uh, for the influencers and then also expectations for how the company has to monitor and audit those influencers so that they can't just kind of run wild and that's consistent with guidance that the FTC has already given, but um, more detail provided now in the order. We also continue to see the FTC, um, certainly with reviews as Serena mentioned, um, and get a lot of questions about that, uh, primarily from companies that are, um, have some com so a competitor that is putting up fake, review fake negative reviews about uh, our client or has a whole bunch of websites that look like they're not affiliated with the competitor. But then uh, if you kind of look behind the, the uh, curtain a little bit, it's pretty easy to figure out that they are affiliated with the competitor. And so um, for companies experiencing that, I think there are options available and certainly um, the FTC, uh, in my experience, has been interested in hearing about those. We continue to get Made in USA uh, questions and that continues to be an ongoing area of interest for the FTC and one where they are constantly uh, watching claims in that space. And uh, it can get a little tough for companies to comply because there are some nuances to the how the FTC standard applies in connection with the customs designation or the Buy America requirements if you're selling to the federal government. And so just um, navigating clients through compliance in that space. As far as tips to clients to, to take away to stay on top of these issues, 
One is what we've already said, train, train, and retrain, because in this space, in the advertising and marketing space, there's a high turnover, even on the best of days, and new people come in, and you might think, well, we just trained on that not that long ago, but you've got new teams in that just might not be familiar with uh, some of those requirements for substantiation or influencers. And then the other one is subscribe to the FTC's business blog and get those uh, updates about cases as they come out. Leslie Fair uh, does a great job, so does everyone else who writes them. Leslie's been a long time contributor and leader in the ABA uh, and I trust section and you learn about what's happening at the FTC and can predict the trends and you might even learn a new lyric to a song or some uh, random fact about an animal as you're reading the blog post as well. So I think those are really just easy things to do uh, to keep you up to date on what's happening. Thanks, Christy. Tom, do you have um, some things to add about advertising and marketing? Serena and Christy covered the waterfront tremendously, so not much to add. The one observation I'll make, or two observations, one is that the velocity has picked up. Companies are really facing pressure to maintain sales and to think very creatively about uh, offers, promotions, and the like. So we're doing this on the fly, and they're, these are companies with the best of intentions, but we have to work with them on their promotions uh, on, on a very short timeline because this is literally about keeping the doors open. The second is on the disparagement. Uh, we are seeing, not surprisingly, clients coming to us complaining that what's either disgruntled you know, employees or even competitors making disparaging comments about the COVID-19 response, things like they're killing their employees and, and the like. And so you know, any, any angle someone like that can use, they will. So we're, we're fielding those. But I think the biggest point is the velocity at which these questions are coming up in this environment. Yeah, excellent point. You know, pe people need to take a little time to, to think about the business decisions that they're making. Um, yeah, the, the title of this program is What to Expect in FTC CP Enforcement. And we want to close uh, with a final comment from the Deputy Director regarding the Commission's position with respect to monetary relief in Section 13B, because we think it's really an important point that our clients need to understand despite the Seventh Circuit's view of that issue. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Serena. Thanks, Kaylin. Yeah, as you mentioned, the FTC's authority to enforce Section 5 in federal court under our Section 13B authority has been challenged recently. And, um, and the question is, whether the FTC can obtain monetary remedies um, under Section 13B. Um, you know, essentially it is, it is, um, it allows a court to enter an injunction and in our view and following decades of Supreme Court precedent, we feel like, yes, that triggers the court's equity jurisdiction and allows the court to impose all other equitable remedies, including equitable monetary relief. As you mentioned, the Seventh Circuit recently in a case called Credit Bureau Center uh, ruled that the current Supreme Court would not follow that prior authority and would uh, and essentially only um, authorize the entry of a behavioral injunction, not um, monetary relief. Um, so as a result of that right now in the Seventh Circuit, um, the FTC um, cannot get monetary relief, but the FTC has also sought uh, cert, cert on that and that's currently pending at the Supreme Court. Um, you know, our view is we've been obtaining equitable monetary remedies under th Section 13B for decades. Um, there have been other circuits that have upheld this authority. Um, in, in fact, Congress has been well aware of the agency's efforts and um, these numerous court decisions. So we think this illustrates congressional intent and that they're not, you know, they're, they're certainly are um, happy with what we're doing. Um, so we are concerned about this ruling, but um, the commission is continuing to seek and obtain equitable monetary relief in court. Um, those issues have been raised by parties in litigation since Credit Bureau Center. Um, we prevailed on those motions. Uh, we're also hearing this argument from companies in settlement discussions, um, but this commission certainly isn't offering any discounts uh, in settlement discussions based on those arguments. So for now, other than the Seventh Circuit, um, it's, it's business as usual at the FTC on 13B. Thanks, Serena. I think that's a good message for, for clients to hear. Um, and so 
We appreciate that. And we appreciate everybody's participation in the panel. Um, we will be with you um, in person next year at the spring meeting. Thanks, everybody. John, back to you. All right. Thanks, Kaylin. That was a great discussion. Now, Stevie, Jenna, um, let me send it back to you. Uh, and and um, Stevie, let's start with you. Um, what are some of the takeaways from today's panel? So I, um, I was pretty impressed with sort of everyone's reiteration of teach, reteach. You know, you have to get this, these important aspects of consumer protection, of privacy, of, of um, data security in folks' minds, not just, you know, the certain set of folks you have working at your company right now, but like continuing education. So anyone who's joining is getting reeducated. Um, and I also thought too that the issue of accountability, of sort of corporate accountability was primary. I know Tom and Carol spoke about that a bit, but actually having C-suite accountability for your um, different data protection measures and privacy measures, or you know, some level of board um, level accountability, I think was really important and probably more so now because everyone's freaking out about COVID-19 to have you know, a central sort of group being accountable for these kinds of measures. Jenna, what about you? Um, well, I think my big takeaway was that when it comes to marketing and advertising, I think we can expect to see more digital marketing and advertising than ever. Um, but again, it's not open season. And that's what we heard on the panel today. Um, our laws continue to apply. And it's fairly clear to me that online reviews and representations made by endorsers and influencers are really an area of priority for the FTC. And we've already seen um, enforcement in this space, for example, with the Timmy case. Um, so borrowing a line from Christy, as uh, Stevie mentioned, that train, train and retrain um, is something that really stuck with me. And I think a great practical tip from Kay Lynn is to incentivize your employees um, by reminding them to participate in additional training in lieu of their morning commute and all of the time they're <laughs> saving. Um, the FTC's enforcement, uh, endorsement influencers and reviews page on its website is a really great resource for uh, folks who want to learn a little more. Stevie, any final thoughts? Well, yeah, something you said is just striking to me because I think another, you know, you know, you have to have folks being educated, going to these web pages, you know, speaking with their bosses or their managers. And I think that was sort of a theme throughout of like, we all need to sort of work towards being better, being more in line with the consumer protection policies and programs. And that goes not just for businesses, but also government to, you know, they're, they're trying to be more clear in their orders about what they're looking for. Um, and there was also discussion too about sort of national and, and international sort of um, coming together to protect consumers and protect the interests of folks who might be particularly slammed right now. Um, and so I think just all of these different measures are so critical. The folks who are, instead of commuting, listening to you know, a, a, a tutorial on what to do, or um, you know, the manager who's talking to someone below him or even the government. So I think that that's just such a, it was such a crucial piece of, I think, what a lot of folks were saying on the panel today. Jenna, last thought from you. No, I'm just interested to see um, where the FTC goes and the, the guidance that's continued to be issued to, um, to consumers and to lawyers and, and what we can do with that and the advice that we're giving our clients. All right, uh, and Stevie, let me, let me throw it back to you for a slightly different topic. You are the young lawyer representative for the Consumer Protection Committee, I believe. We um, both are. <laughs> well, well, let's start with you. Tell, tell, me, tell, me, tell me what you do as the young lawyer representative. Sure. So we um, we meet monthly with the Consumer Protection ABA group, um, but we also do sort of piecemeal projects for folks. Um, this can include like, you know, updating newsletters or publications. It can include a lot of sort of um, uh, student reach out to get them involved with the ABA and the, you know, sort of the consumer protection section of the F uh, ABA specifically. Um, one of the other things that's really great is that the Consumer Protection Group is very sort of intertwined, works a lot with other groups in the ABA. So actually this past year, in conjunction with the Women's Initiative, I got to interview Leslie Fair, who's a senior attorney at the FTC. And you actually heard her mentioned in the panel as sort of this really awesome person who 
does all these blogs about um, consumer protection issues. So I did a 10 things article for her um, and <laughs> it ranged in topics from her path to the FTC to the importance of networking and her favorite things to cook. So it was, it was great. And I think that that's the kind of experience that, you know, folks can get um, just, I mean, we're kind of like not entry level, but people can get going into these um, great ABA groups. Leslie Fair is a friend of the Our Curious Amalgam podcast. And, and I, you can listen to her. I believe we have one episode where we've talked to, to Leslie in the past. And yeah, she's a very interesting person. Jenna, how about you? Uh, what have you done over the last year that's been fun? Well, as Stevie mentioned, as YLRs, we frankly have countless opportunities to get involved in writing, helping planning programming. And um, Stevie and I have recruited about 20 law students from across Canada and the U.S. to join our Young Lawyer Advisory Panel. Um, and basically, we just get them involved in programming. They can do write-ups after, after our programming. So I think getting involved with the programming has been the most meaningful experience for me um, because it's a unique opportunity to be able to interact with different enforcers, uh, competition and antitrust practitioners, and also other committee members. So, um, so far this year, we've been involved in planning programming on cross-border um, consumer protection issues regarding marketing to children. We've been working on one um, inv involving online travel agencies, and we have an upcoming enforcers panel so overall, it's really been a fantastic experience. Great. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Stevie. Um, we also want to thank uh, the terrific panelists today, and particularly Kaylin Brumbaugh for putting it all together. Um, and lastly, uh, we want to thank uh, our members, you who are watching us. Uh, we're very grateful that, that you've joined us today. And so until next time, please be well and be safe.